well, more on that conversation and other conversations that are important to you as a citizen of Uganda will be running on the first show right here on Select TV. And we have got you covered when it comes to stories of national importance. Now, Robert Chagulani, you remember clearly, is one of the people who was not even one of the people, the only person, the only opposition leader who got an armored car. Where he got it from, we don't know. There was a ship that docked on Mombasa port and the allegations and rumors, mark the word rumors, is that that ship that came all the way from US and docked on the Mombasa port is what brought in Robert Chagulani's armored car. Uh, Happy usually says about Ahmad, about, about Ahmad. She gets confused with, with, with the word Ahmad. But it's bulletproof, so to say. So the car, the bulletproof car that was brought into the country by who knows, but it is in the country. And Uganda Revenue Authority is confused on how exactly that car got into the country without their knowledge, have called or called for Robert Chagulani to bring back that car so that they confirm whether the taxes were paid or not. Robert Chagulani said he won't be bringing back that car because that car was with them and they should have followed the process while it was there before it was released. So why wait until it gets released for you to tell me to bring it back? I mean, even if it was me, I wouldn't do that. And then later on, there is now an online platform that the IGD has created for all leaders to declare their wealth, income, assets and liabilities and they said that all leaders with no exemption should be able to do that however yesterday the IGG said unfortunately only a small percentage of the leaders have done so and the majority have refused to do so yet the deadline of the online application is 31st of this exact month and he said that the leaders need to declare their assets if they don't want to face consequences from the office of the IGG and he and and, and, the, and the information is that the reason why this is being done is because they need to know which assets have been obtained illegally by which people so that they can be dealt with and it helps with corruption and graft according to the IGG's office. Now she says the group that has actually come up and declared their assets is NRM and the opposition members have not declared their assets and she calls upon them to do so. She said over 50 political parties that are registered in the country, none of them have declared their assets. Let's look at the story where she's asking upon them, she's calling upon them to come and register their assets in order to deal with corruption in the country and then we'll be back. 31st of this month to fill in the IGG's online declaration forms of assets and liabilities to avoid unlikely consequences. During a parliamentary seat at Parliament, the Speaker, Rebecca Itwala Kadaga, launched and tested the online declaration forms. According to the second deputy IGG, Riamu Wangadia, noted that the platform will only work on leaders who are not re-elected in the office after the past general election. The Secretary of Government believes that the ease of declaration provided by the online system will enable leaders to comply with submission of the exit declaration in a convenient and efficient manner. The exit declaration module in particular enables leaders who are ceasing to serve as public officers to declare their incomes, assets and liabilities within six months from the end of their service period. Wagadia said they are disappointed over the low turn up of the asset declaration. Only 5.2% have been confirmed out of the targeted 30,000 leaders. The current statistics of leaders that have so far submitted as at 10th March 2021 stands as follows. 2,509 leaders have logged in. Of these, 1,567 have successfully submitted their declarations. This represents 5.2% of the leaders who are due to declare. 
As the Inspectorate of Government, we are concerned at this low rate. She further informed the speaker that the office of the IGG has registered success by recovering 1.2 billion shillings and 3 billion shillings from assets and properties that were obtained by public officials through corrupt means. Public officers, which aids asset tracing and verification as well as asset recovery. Three, information contained in a declaration form is indispensable for asset tracing and recovery. Four, asset recoveries or refund of funds, for example, a block of apartments worth 1.2 billion shillings. Prosecutions, leaders are prosecuted for amassing of wealth or illicit enrichment under the Anti-Corruption Act 2009. Meanwhile, the first deputy IGG, George Bamgamere's term of the office has expired today after serving for a period of eight years since 2013. Now the office of the first deputy IGG falls vacant together with one of the full IGG, which has worried the first deputy IGG, Wangadia, saying this will... ...so much for that story and those details as well. Olala, we have to let our assets be declared because here is where we're going to catch corrupt officials. But does it entirely work? Do they truly get the people that are supposed to be goaten? Because here's the thing. Whatever well, Latifa Hamid, I can have a building in town. And then I put it under Don's name. And I say a building yet Don. And remember, Don is not a leader. But that means that asset is not going to be put in the book. I'm going to have 100 buildings in the middle of town. I tell you, the local person knows Zonaza Latifa. Nainga Latifa, yazi wandise mulinyari omu tumulala. Not one person, but 10 other people. So you don't have knowledge as the IDG that uh, that asset belongs to Latifa. How are we going to deal with that? Are some of the questions that are being raised. So that means that Robert Chagulani is supposed to declare his Ahmad, Ahmad. <laughs> his armored car to the IDG's office and all the other opposition candidates are supposed to do so as well. Now, Mariam Wagadia said that she released a list of the most compliant institutions and those that have declared their assets at 100%. We have the office of the president and the vice president that have declared 100% of their assets. There's the permanent secretaries that also have declared 100% of their assets. The public service commission has declared 100% of their assets. The parliament of Uganda, only 94.4% have declared. And Rebecca Kadaga has shown you that she's declaring her assets. So that, so that means Rebecca Kadaga is among the 94.4% that have declared their assets. The Petroleum Authority of Uganda, 93.3% have declared their assets. The Electricity Regulatory Authority, 93.3%, just like petroleum. The ministers, 93.2%, well, lower than petroleum and, elect and, and, and electricity regulatory authority. Ministry of Finance and Planning, 93.04%. Uganda NAT Council of Science and Technology, 91.7%. The Auditor General's Office, 91.3. Obogalo for them because they've done a good job. Now coming to the least compliant institutions. Uganda Tourism Board is among the least compliant institutions with 7.14%, very low. Atomic Energy Council has only declared 10%. National Library of Uganda. National Library of Uganda is actually better than Uganda Tourism Board and Atomic Energy Council put together because they've registered 31.25%. Uganda Broadcasting Corporation, UBC, has declared 33.33%. Uganda Cooperative Transport Union, 33.33%. Uganda Land Commission, Kilembe Mines, Joint Clinic Research Center, Gulu University. Now, those are among the people that are least compliant. And then they have the compliant districts and all that list that if you want information to, just go to our page on STV Uganda Official and you'll get this particular list of the most compliant and non-compliant districts. Of course, the districts in the eastern part are very compliant. And then the least compliant districts are my part uh, of north and the other parts of the country.
Well, there you go. That is the detail we had for you from the IGG's office. Is we'll take a short break and then we'll be right back with discussing what exactly is happening in the education system of the country and where did the radios that we talked about, the nine million radios and televisions that were supposed to be given to a number of villages in Uganda, where did they go to? Because now we are launching a computer literacy program where 10,000 schools will be the ones that benefit from these computer literacy programs and they will start with government schools. But what is the reality of that? What was the budget in that? And what happened to radios and televisions? Stay with us.